think so many people have embraced censorship? Why do you think that has become, why do you think um, the embracing of censorship has become such a, like a reflex action for so many people? They don't hesitate to want to silence people. They don't hesitate to say, well, I didn't agree with him. So kick their story, kick their show off of YouTube. I think it's very simple. I think it's because after Trump won, if half the country had it in their head that the other half of the country ruined the country with their bad ideas and that uh, therefore um, we have an obligation, not just to write, but we have an obligation uh, to control which ideas they have access to and which ideas they absorb. Um, that's why Alex Jones got taken off. We look at the difference between 2016 and 2020. Um, Alex Jones, that's a, that's an example of censorship. But you also had Roger Stone get arrested. You had Steve Bannon get arrested. Milo Yiannopoulos got censored, right? I mean, in 2016, you had these guys running around, running their mouths. And whatever you think of Alex Jones or Milo or anything, like, to me, that's the democratic process is everybody gets to run their mouth. And if democracy is really so great, then the crazies will be dismissed as crazies, right? Um, but when you push a population to a point where there are no, uh, quote unquote, sane solutions to their problems, then, of course, they're going to start looking elsewhere. And in 2016, they were able to do that, which is a large part of why Trump was able to break through in 2016. And the fact that they took those voices off the board, made them out of bounds uh, through both the legal system and through the merging of government and big tech censorship, uh, they were able to keep Trump just, uh, you know, uh, south of where he needed to be to win in 2020. That's a huge, huge difference there. So, yeah, it all comes down to, Trump winning made half the country feel like they had an obligation to suppress uh, the thoughts, spoken words, and access to information of the half of the country that they blamed for, you know, this just apocalyptic event that they, that they had to endure. That's it. Going forward from that point, they no longer uh, felt any need to uphold the old ACLU standards of – I may not believe in what you say, but I'll fight to the death for your right to say it because Trump, they felt demonstrated that that does not work. If you remember at that time, I'm almost positive it was Jacobin that was spreading around this article that was going back to one of the Greek philosophers, but probably Plato, arguing that democracy uh, doesn't work if you give people too much of it because they'll elect a tyrant. Um, that was that was a very popular article among liberals at that moment. Um, and it was just an open case against too much democracy. It was this open elitist case that the people are uh, the masses, the people. They can't I mean, be think, given too much choice. I mean, do you think it's possible that Assange exposing what had happened during the 2016 primary, which I think we were all pretty aware of, but needed firm confirmation as to what was really going on behind the scenes and knowing full well that there is legitimate election rigging that takes place in this country, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that kind of set things in motion, kind of like for the blue pill versus the red pill people, like the blue pill people want all of that put back in the bag. You put the cat back in the bag. I don't the, want the, to the know. Truth say, you're, no, you're that's, talking that's, about the people in power. But that's for the, a good point. for the average lib, they never even read that shit. Yeah, but you mentioned Assange, and actually, I used to put Assange in that grouping of Alex Jones and Milo and things like that. And I don't anymore. I, it doesn't come to mind because I don't really think of Assange as an agent of Trump. He wasn't on the Trump campaign. But certainly, the revelations that he put forward did help Trump that time. And what did they do to him? Right? I mean, that's the most dramatic example. So I'm glad you brought him up because he absolutely belongs. Uh, in that list of other names in that sense. Obviously, he's not the same guy. He's not doing it the same thing from the same perspective and motivation that they are. But that's an example. You had WikiLeaks, right? Um, you know, do some of its most famous work in 2016, exposing the DNC. Um, and they were nowhere to be found in 2020. You just had a much more curated and sanitized media space in 2020. Those those perspectives uh, were not given the oxygen to break through. Well, especially with uh, Schmovid 
You know? Well, with that too, <laughs> like, obviously, like you know, that, you that had all that up going to on. Level. Yeah, that amped it up to another level. Absolutely, absolutely, a hundred percent. Is but, that the word we can't say? Is that what it is? Rob? I no, mean, where, where are we, you can say that. I'm being extra careful because we're no, not. Because we're not we in our recently, own house. We recently on one of our recent videos, and Peter doesn't always notice because he doesn't do the monetization. But like sometimes in the titles, whatever he puts will get us limited monetization or whatever it is. And I wasn't sure if maybe that was one of the words. It's it, it depends. I, I there doesn't seem to be any real consistency to it. For some reason, now we're having an easier time getting the videos monetized. I think it's just because, like, when your audience grows, they figure they have more money to make off of you, so they let you monetize more videos. You for know now. what I mean? So, like, for now, you've got it for now. Yeah, for now. yeah, for now. No, don't take anything for granted. Of course. No. Yeah. And no, got, I mean, I mean that ahead. that is part of why Keaton always, uh, you know, rings this bell. Like, hey, subscribe to us on Rumble. You never know what's going to happen over here. Now I am I'm pretty confident that as it becomes more and more clear that Biden is going to lose and you throw into the mix that there's a third party candidate that they're going to blame, even though I I think the Republicans could run Mickey Mouse. And that's and, what I said. And, and Biden is going down. But of course, if they have a third party candidate to blame, they're going to. All of us in this alternative media space, they could shut the whole fucking thing down. They, I, it, they have shut down some very big channels that were making them a lot of money. Because what you got to remember is even though we're in this politics space, YouTube is much bigger than this politics space, man. And we're, we actually, if you look at how much viewership we bring in, yeah. No, it's people, not a drop in the box. Pe people, people who do videos about, hey, I got asked by a viewer, what's the deepest hole you could dig on Earth? So right. we're going to talk about that. Those motherfuckers do five million views on those videos. <laughs> exactly, <yeah. laughs> Seriously, we're nothing to them. They could shut the whole space down. Yeah, well, they suppressed the space. I'm looking for the razor again. Jesus. <laughs> well, don't get depressed. We could just we 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 can do uh, what uh, an uh, an archaeology show. Yeah, <laughs> I want to and, and one and one final thought on that topic. You know, obviously, you know, Kyle has um, he has shifted. We'll, we'll just say that um, his he's really moved away from that radical, you know, populist left type of, of course. Uh, type of show. And when he said the other day that. You should vote for Biden if you live in a swing state, or at least he's going to do so. I'm I'm just curious if you think that – I think that's going to fall on deaf ears this time. I don't think there's going to be as much of an influence to say, well, we all have to get in line and vote for Joe. I don't think that's going to work. I think that that's going to be met with a lot of pushback in a way that hasn't been done before. And I think there's there, there's sort of like a losing – of the narrative, so to speak, something as simple as, you know, Brie coming out and saying, you don't have to vote for Joe Biden. Now, of course, you had you saw the people, you know, freaking out like, no, you have to vote for Joe. Biden. actually, no, you don't have to do anything. You can vote whoever you want to vote for. And your vote should be earned, not given. Uh, the same is true for all of the unions bringing the conversation full circle. You know, it would have been one thing if there was an actual extraction for their vote. And he is the president. So he could have done something. And they decided, no, we're fine. We don't need anything. And that, to me, is an example of if they're going to try to come at them and say, well, you know, you have to vote for Joe if you live in Pennsylvania, if you live in Arizona and so on. I don't I don't see it. Now, we're fortunate that we live in New York and Florida, respectively, where the vote is not going to matter. One state's going blue, one's going red. But for people in other places, they're going to try to create this narrative of, well, you know, you really got to vote for Joe. I know Joe sucks. In this. I don't see it. I, I just I, 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 don't, I agree. Well, that, well, that's why I think Cornell has a shot at 5%, because I think there are going to be enough people at this point who are prepared to let the Republicans win just to burn the system down. And that's what you need to get 5% for your third party candidate. You Is need enough people who party? feel like that. Is and also, you know, party? the thing I don't understand about Kyle, you know, is that, you know, he says, well, I didn't vote for Biden in 2020 but this time if i were in a swing state i definitely would like how in what world are you living in where biden is more attractive now than he was 
three years ago. Like, <laughs> whose support did the, he gain? It's the most important election years? of our lifetime. Right, because the, the thing that really, you know, not only do you have a star on the green ticket now in Cornell West, that's one part of it. The other part of it, to me, the bigger part of it, the, the, the biggest part of this, is that in 2016, you had this perception of risk, right? Because is can we really have Donald Trump become president? Like, what kind of mess will that be? Donald Trump was a game show host at the time. We had no idea what we were in store for with a President Trump. 2020, obviously, because of the pandemic, the risks were perceived to be extremely high, right? You have a president who is just completely out to lunch. He's just letting Fauci do the whole thing, and he doesn't have an opinion one way or the other. And so, like... You're thinking, are we ever going to get to just go to the supermarket without a cloth on our face again, as long as this fucking guy is here? So there was the perception of risk there, where it was like, all right, I guess a liberal bureaucracy, as shitty as it is, will at least handle this with some measure of competency, which turns out they really didn't. Um, but it, there was at least that perception of risk. Can we survive? Like, literally, can we survive four more years of Trump? Right. Right. Now, there's not that risk anymore. Like now, OK, Trump is a known quantity. We've been there. DeSantis is a, a, a sick maniac with the torture and the this and the that. But, you know, we've been there, too, with Bush. Like, we know what we're into. We know what we're getting into uh, there. Um, and what we have is it's just like Bush so, and Cheney in one man. Yeah, in one man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and what we have now is just so clearly untenable and so so dangerous, both in terms of the censorship and the the stoking of World War Three abroad. Like, like there there is not the feeling in the air now that the Republicans represent this existential risk to our immediate well being um, that they did in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty sixteen, which kept a lot of people voting blue. Right? Like, I think in twenty twenty four, like th there is going to be this very very pervasive feeling that we've got nothing to lose. By not voting blue. I mean, and I didn't vote just for the record, just so everybody knows. I didn't vote blue either of those times. But I'm just saying people who are not, you know, me, I think even people who are more neurotic or people who live in swing states, I think they're going to be less persuaded by the idea that, well, we just we, we can't let Trump win. What will that be like? Yeah, it'll be like 2017 to 2019. Uh, what about DeSantis? Well, that'll be a replay of, you know, the the Bush years to an extent, not to the same extent, obviously. I mean, George Bush is singularly murderous, oh. right? Um, but, you know, we've, we've seen that type, right? And there's the sense, I mean, Ajamu uh, Baraka was on the Bad Faith show and he's, he put it exactly the way I would put it. And I, I think it was very smart. He says, I trust the people to survive four more years of Trump. We've, we've seen Trump. We can we can we can weather four more years of Trump. He said, I don't know if we can weather four more years of Biden. Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media and consider joining our Patreon where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out.